Okay, so yeah, I think like like you were saying, this is it, it is all about sort of actually making good looking visuals, isn't it? That sort of get the message across quite well to others rather than um, just doing lots of quick plots. And I, I thought I'd just go through it. Really, I've, I've gone through it on um, in our in our studio. And if it's okay with you, I think probably rather than spending lots of time sort of talking about it, if it's only the two of us, just run well, through. And, no, whatever way, is, if it is our studio or the notes, whatever option, I am okay with it. Yeah. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, so, so we'll try and do it. Try and sort of. I'll see how I get on. I'll probably switch, and I might end up just sticking in one or the other. Um, so they talk about prerequisites, and I've I've already uploaded the packages and a couple of others that I've used for some of the exercises as well. Um, so the, the first thing really they look at is um, labels. So you've plotted stuff, and if people are going to know what it is, obviously it needs to be well labeled. Otherwise, it's just dots on a screen, I guess. Um, so if we look at 13.2, so the sort of way that we'd always been doing the plots as exploratory plots, um, you know, it was, it was like that. So, you know, you can tell what it is, um, but it's, you know, you'd need to know a bit about where the data set comes from to really understand what's going on. So in, in the labels um, command, which you just add using the plus sign there, uh, you can add titles, subtitles, captions, um, which makes the whole diagram much easier to understand. As you can see now, it's telling us exactly what we've plotted. We've got the title there, fuel efficiency generally decreases with size. We've got a caption explaining that sports cars are, are slightly out of the, um, the limits of most of the, other, the rest of the data set, because obviously they're very small and light. So, um, you know, they're, they're better than an SUV, despite having large engines. Um, we've got a caption to tell us where the data came from. And we've also labelled the, um, the legend and the axes um, quite clearly. So it's really easy to understand um, exactly what's going on there. Um, and but, yeah, I think I've just skipped through lots of several steps they actually built that up more slowly just showing it with a title to start with um then adding subtitle and caption and then rather than having that class which was the column header it took we've actually said well actually what we'd like to to label that as is car type and that's how that whole plot's been built up yeah Tina um, can just add to the label function there I think the label there we have, uh, we have the title, okay? So from what I got from the chapter is that the title should be something that summarizes the main finding from the data. Because yeah. if you check some visualization or some people, they can just say a graph of maybe highway versus this. They might put that in the title because you already ex we, already, we already know what is this, what is the X axis, what variable is mapped to the Y axis. So once they do explain in the book also that once we are to put the title, it should be like the findings from the visualization so that it will be very easy for our audience that are going through the visualization to take the key message, to understand the key finding, the key message in which the plot is conveying. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point, isn't it? Because um, you can see they're actually telling us the conclusion, aren't they? Just like you say. Yeah, so that's, that's good. Um, yeah, so you can also, within that, that labeling function, you can actually use um, mathematical strings. Um, so if you want to write that, you can see how they've built up um, the formula by using quote instead of um, the quotation marks, and then a, a sort of a descriptive notation of what the symbols actually are in the text. So, so you can actually do quite a bit there using the labels function. Um, so if we have a look at the exercises quickly, so create one plot on the fuel economy data with customized titles and stuff. 
So um, customized subtitle. So actually, that's just. Um, I think I cheated. I pinched the one from the exercise. That's <laughs> where's my run yes. button it's hiding behind that, isn't it? No, you oh, is there. Know. You can just use Control Enter if you are ah, on Windows. That's a good pro tip. Control Enter, is it? Yes. There we go. So you can kind of see. I mean, that I think that is just the one I stole straight from the exercise because it's already there and it's doing all the things that were asked for yes. and then recreate the following plot using the fuel economy data um, and it's saying that both colors and shapes of points vary by drivetrain so you can see we've actually in the aesthetic we've got the color and the shape mapping to drive which is yes, yes. there it's asking us to produce that plot yes yes code, hopefully that's exactly the same thing. So there we go. We've got color and shape, which I think. Oh, can you? Oh, I've, I've, I've missed a bit, haven't I? Yes, line break. You did not put the line break, and also, and uh, if you look at the axis, le the legend we are having uh, yeah. two legend map there because GG, if ggplot two find it difficult to match the two layer because the titles they are different. Yeah. So what's the trick? I can't remember that now. Could, can you remember how you? Can you take shape outside of the John Point, the aesthetics for John Point? Yes, outside remove. The... Yes, let's see it outside. Remove the comma there. And then we'll put it here? Yes, comma, then you put it there. Let's see what will happen. Oops, hang on, what have I just done there? Undo. Yeah. That's weird. Mess up. We... Let's go back up. Where were we? Shape. That's it. So I was going to put shape in there, wasn't yes. I? Yes. No, yeah. put a comma. No, put a comma. There will be a comma before the shape. Yes. Yeah. That's it. yeah. 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 Run it. Let's see what we got. Yeah. Control error drive not far. Okay, okay. Oh, shape is equals to drive. Where is the drive? Put a string for the drive. Within string. quotes, drive. Yes, no, outside, outside for the shape. Oh, for the shape here. Yeah. Hmm. See what is that? Can't find shape. Okay. So return it back to where you have. Let's see what we do. What what do I want to do? Return it back. Remove the string. Remove the string. For the yes. shape. Yes. No, for the drive, there should be no string. You are quoting the, the drive. Oh, there, remove sorry, yeah. yeah. So what do you remove there for me, for the, you remove, you comment the laps, for the laps, comment out the color, let's see first. So to do which, sorry? Yes, line 44, comment out line 44. Oh, comment out, yeah. Uh, so run it, let's see. So it need two of those. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. So this is what they got. That's yeah. Which is so go back to the notes. Let's see the notes. Okay. So this is what they got. So for you to get that same title, so go back to your plot. Uh, for us to get that same title. So on yeah. comment line 44, on comment line 44. Yeah. Yes. Change it to what's... So you put a, put another line, say color, shape, put another... That's, yes. Another line, shape, is equals to the same title. Give it the same title. Yes. 
That's it. Put a, a comma, put a comma. No, at the end, put a comma. So this is live coding that we are doing. <laughs> this is, this is. And there we so go. This is, this is a zap. But what we have not done here, the line breaks. So if you go back, so go breaks. back, Where go back to the notes. Break? So what you do there, go back to the notes. Let's see where type they break. Off, try, okay, try. type off. So type so, off then uh, forward slash and end. No, not this one, not this one, forward. That is backward slash, forward slash, yeah. Then come down, forward slash and end. So run it, I think that is exactly what they have from the book. That's it, success, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's, okay, I'm gonna take an exploratory graph from something you've done in the last month. So I don't know if you remember, but ages ago, when we did, um, you know, sort of file imports and things. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, use this data set, Aberporth, um, so oh. local weather station stuff, really. Yes, yes. I think I remember the data set. That's it, yeah, because you, you explained to me how to get the NA to work. Yes. And, then, and what I just ended up doing with it is I've calculated... Um, move a 10 year rolling average and then an average of temperatures. Okay. So let's have a look. I can't even remember how I did. I, th I think this works. Okay. Uh, Done. Well, I'll stick okay. to Let's generate the data set. And then if we run that, and there you go. So I've got the title in, the temperature, the year. What I couldn't get to work out, right, is um, because I wanted to have the two type, I've got line type and color. So that does, that legend is the same as we were doing just before. I don't know if we can fix it the same way. Okay. You mean the legend for what, the period? Well, we've got the period, and ideally, what I'd like is um, a legend okay. to show. You know, okay, the legend should be time. red. It should be dotted line red. But we are having black legend, which is not conveying what the plot is saying. That's right. So, yeah. can, so can we go back to the visualization? We have X. We map year to X, which is correct. Then we are having germ line. Aesthetic Y is value. Okay, the value is what temperature, January temperature. Well, it's um, if, if we look at the, the data, it's Jan mean, isn't it? That's the that's the data. So basically, I've, I've sort of pivoted longer. So you've got the measure is either the maximum oh. or the minimum, and then okay. the period is either an annual or a 10 year mean. Okay, I understand. So let's go back to the code again. So let me see the code. Okay, why is value, color is measure. Okay, line type is, is equals to period plus. Oh. You know why? So say color is equals to, color is equals to period, let's see. Color equals period. Yes. Let's see what that gives us. No. That's because look at this. You see, if I go back to measure. Make sure that's working. Yeah, because I want the color to be so this is this is right here, you see. So you've got the measure in red, I want the maximum, and in blue, I want the minimum. Okay, but the period is not uh the period is not correct, but well the it's correct in the graph because the idea is I wanted the red dotted line for the annual. 
That's just and the he's mean. not. So in let's see again. Okay. And that is the Line ten. Time. Oh, let's see. Uh, here you are down here, and we have Anwar. And you'd have to manually specify the legend somehow, wouldn't you? Rather than, can you override the legend? Uh, I don't. We have ten here, and we have Anwar. I'm still. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, line tab. Line tab is equals to period. So, okay, are you sure this period is a fab categorical variable? Can you say line tab is equals to factor period? So, with line? Line 88, line 88. Yeah. Color equals... Where we have, no, where we have line type. Oh, line type, yeah. Put a fact, wrap it within a factor. F A F A C. No, What's not this, it? not factor. Then open bracket, close the bracket also. Close again, close again. That's Run it, let's see. What do we get? Uh, it's the same plot, isn't it? It's the same plot. I don't know what is wrong. I don't know what is wrong. But I'm okay, maybe the it's the labeling that I'm not happy with. Uh, so that we will not just observe this, we'll come back to it at the end of our discussion and see yeah. how we can walk through this. See how we're doing for time, yeah. Uh, so just observe that line, we'll come back to it. Okay. Let's move on to annotations. Okay, so it's looking at how we can use GM text to actually label, uh, um, which actually might be the answer to what we're just looking at. Um, basically, we're making label info from the data set. Um, to produce the actual legend description there. So if we try running that, this is just generating a label um, and selecting the fields we want for the label. So if I just run that, we've got label information. It's, but the, we've got the drive type and also displacement and highway. And I think it's taken, basically it's arranged it descending and taken the top one. So we've got the maximum displacement for each of those. So then if we do the plot, that bit's fairly normal. It's just a scatter plot with a low alpha so we can see through it. We've got a smooth line and then we're actually labeling with um, geom text using label okay. info, which we've just produced, and plotting displacement against um, highway fuel efficiency, and then using drive type, which is using the um, the info from label, I think. So where it says label is equal to drive type from here, drive type. So okay. There you go. So we've actually got bold. If I just set that to bold, it's slightly larger. And we've positioned those labels justified right and bottom. And that is kind of okay, but it overlaps there. Yes. You could do something very similar using geo label. Which and we repositioned it slightly as well with um, the nudge on the Y, just to bring it um, up a bit. Yes. 
yeah and then it's, it's more easy to read because we've got the white background using the label um, and then it goes on to talk about using um, gg repel yes okay. so we've got John, geo label repel which and John Dex repel. other things as well then doesn't it it makes sure they don't touch anywhere and it adds these um, little pointers to the label so it points out exactly where it is um, and that kind of works so I actually think that one looks better to me yes yes I, I, I think this that's just a bit busy but the next example I think it works really brilliantly and there's a nice idea in here as well so we've got creating a data set for potential outliers so if we look at if we just look at the data sets you get here, okay, you can see we've got some data points that are outside of what looks like the normal range. Yes. yes. And it's actually collecting those into potential outliers. So we're just looking at everything above this 40 line and everything with a displacement greater than five. Um, that's it. So with the highway greater than 20 and the displacement greater than five. So it's above this line. So this area here, we're also considering as outliers. So if we create that data set there, we'll just run that. Um, and that's just taken these nine points. And then if we plot that, um, we're actually using text labels on them using text repel so it's using gg repel again to keep them spaced out nicely um, and it's just plotting these outliers now so we've got the top bit producing this basic plot we've already seen and then in red we're actually plotting the, the outliers um, and also it's doing them in two slightly different styles so when you do that you get a little circle inside a bigger circle and it's labeled. Yes. So I think that that I thought was really nice. Yeah. Um, and even if, I think with I think using geo and text, even if you just want a label, you've actually got to generate a data frame to use that. So here we've okay. got another fairly basic plot with a simple label just up there. But to use this um, function, you know, you have to have a data set. You've got to create that before you do it. OK, you can manually generate your data set. And um, with the displacement, um, if you set the parameter, the displacement to infinity and highway to infinity it's not actually taking it to infinity it's just putting it right in the top right so it's taking it to the highest bit and then if we run that plot again you can see we've got the same label but we've placed it manually in the top right but if you don't want to create a data frame yeah. We can add it. Text. So here we're doing, I think, pretty much the same thing. So we're annotating and saying within the annotate function, geom equals text. We've got the same position, but rather than referring to by the variable names, displacement and highway, we're actually using X and Y in here. We can manually put our label text and place it within the annotate function. So there you go, and if I go back, it's basically produced the identical plot, um, but without having to produce that data frame. Um, okay, I think that is a very, to me, that is, the annotation is a very useful function. Maybe we want to add a certain annotation to a specific point in the plot. So we can draw, because the first argument is always in the annotate function, is the geometry because within the geometry we specify the type of geometry maybe we can annotate points 
uh, we can annotate segment, we can annotate curve. So we can annotate text, we can annotate label to specific points and ggplot2 will just place it at that point. Maybe we can now annotate text to convey information that maybe this, this point, this is what is going on here. So now as the readers, they are going through uh, the visualization. It becomes very clear. You don't, you don't need to explain more. They, once they look at the plot, they know what you are trying to convey to them. So the plot will become easy for them to follow along. I think this is a very useful function. Yeah, and like you say, it's nice and simple just having it all in the one function, isn't it? You can sort of set the whole thing up. Um, and you, again, you can, it's, the next one is still using annotate, but we're now using geome label um, and also geome segment. So um, whereas we had text before, we're now going to using label, which I'm guessing will probably introduce the white background. We're defining the position of where we want it, justifying it and putting a color to it. And then segment actually is going to produce an arrow. So a segment is just a straight line running yes, yes. three to five and the Y is running from 35 to 25. So we're going from three, five, three to 25, 35. And it's putting an arrowhead on the end. So again, that's, you know, it makes it even simpler really, isn't it? It's using the same annotate function, but we're really making it nice and easy to see what's going on. Um, this shows a way of adding line breaks if you want. Um, I think this is my own function. The str wrap from Stringer is very useful. You like this one? Yes, the SDR wrap. Yeah. So that's, oh, we're defining the width of the, the box. Yeah, is that right? So that it's rest, that yes. automatically adding the line break to keep it within yes. the box. Yeah. Yes, yes. So you can define exactly the size of the box. So that's a nice way of doing it as well. There's just so many different ways, aren't there? Because then it goes on now, geo <laughs> with infinite positions to place oh, oh this is the exercise isn't it so what we've actually got is i i I've, it probably would have been better with annotate maybe i don't know but i've got label info gm text i think i've jumbled up to yeah this is question two down there so I think if I just run that bit, see we've got okay. the label bottom left. Yes. And then if we want to move it up to top left, that's still going to be zero displacement, but it's going to be infinity on highway. And then I think we're going to need to change the vertical. I'll we'll see what that does. Ah. Why isn't that <laughs> what Capi, look at the, the spelling is typo there is a typo line two four five capital i supposed to be capital i ah yes <laughs> I, I i've done that so many times over the last couple of days <laughs> i think i'd have remembered by now so it was up to there run that there you go but it's disappeared off the top. So rather than justifying to the bottom, I actually want it to justify top. Okay. So label info stays the same. All I've changed is the way I'm justifying. And there you go. Comes Perfect. There. And going through that same process, you could obviously then have highway infinite and displacement infinite. And you could have displacement infinite and highway zero. So using that, you can kind of place it wherever you want. No, I think that, two, two that, is one, that is one thing with ggplot, you will take enough time to do your annotation, to make, make adjustment on the visualization. Yeah, <laughs> but it's quite satisfying. I quite enjoy trying to puzzle it all out. You know, it's like the process is fun as well. So I think, yeah, question two, it's the same plot. Um, 
but we want to add a point gm in the middle of that last plot without creating a tibble. So we're using annotate and then customize the shape, size, or color. So what I've done here is I've used annotate, geom point, set the size to three and the color to red. And if we run that, that should, yeah, that's put another yeah. bomb. Yes. In the middle. Then the next question, how does it interact with faceting? And how can you add a label to a single facet? Or a different label in each facet. So if you, first of all, if we just try to see what happens, if we run that same plot, but facet wrap on class. Uh, oh, there's a dot there, isn't there? Okay. So there you go, it's basically put the same plot with the same title in every box. So all of that information is just reproduced in each facet. Yes. Now to just, basically what I've done here is I only wanted to, to um, put a label. So how have I done this? I don't that's just so this just creates two different labels. Yeah, so we're using SUV info. So what, what I've done is basically generated a label, but only where the class is equal to SUV. That right. If I run that, oh, that's the end of the facet wrap. Pass. So there you go. You can see that the label is only now yeah. on the facet for yes. SUV. I think, I think, was that all the questions? Yes, yes. Yeah. So there's a couple of questions then on geom label controlling the background and the four arguments to arrow. Um, so I, th I think that was all pretty straightforward with geom label. We can just get rid of So what have we got? Got label size, adding. What's it asking exactly about the label? I can't see. Yeah, so it doesn't look like you can change, I can't see how to change the color. You can certainly change the size, the position. That looks Is like the size of the color line. Of, color of what? I can? Is it the color of what? What do we want to change? Can you go back to the background equation? color of the box I was wondering about. Uh, yeah. Uh, inherit dot aesthetics is show legend and uh, check overlap force. No, still go down. I can't see anything that will do the color. Still screw down. Let's still check the documentation. Oh, hang on. That's the text. Oh, that'll be of the text though, not of the back label. So that's geom label. Yeah, so if geom text, you can change the color. Yes. I don't think we can with label. No. Okay. And then, oh, the four arguments to an arrow. You've, I think you've got, what's it? The, oh, no, I can't remember now. You've got the length, haven't you? Is it open or closed? Yeah. Um, Just check GM arrow. GM arrow, is it? Yeah. How's it written? Gigi, just say Gigi plots, column, column. Gigi, Gigi plots, plot. plot two, column, column. Gigi plot two, double column. What Double column. Double column. Double As if time. you are calling, 
I see you are calling GG Plot from your namespace. Oh, like that you mean? Yeah, no, not like this, not like this. Double column, I see you want to call a function from your namespace. I don't know, I, I don't understand, double column. Let me oh, put it in the charts. Like yes, 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 yes. Another one. Yeah. Yes, then now type Joom arrow. Underscore arrow. It's not there. No, it's not finding it. Let's see, let me see. Joom arrow. Is oh, coming with arrows. it's coming with segments. Let me see so that I'll post it to the charts. Geom arrow is with segments. Segments. Geom segments or then we have arrow is equals to arrow. There are four types, I mean, five that we have, type, end, length, and angle. So what do you do there? Are you with me? No, hang on, I need to, I need to try and get to the chat. It's going to the... So you go to geom underscore segments. Oh, geom underscore yeah. segments. Uh... Segments. No, don't, no, don't use the equation mark. Uh, enter it, geom segments. Click on it, then press your tab key. Which key? Just be, no, just be inside the function, step into the function. Okay, Hit, yeah. Hit tab. Uh -oh, See, yeah. Yes, then go down to arrow. That one. Yes, click on it, type arrow again. Yes, click on the arrow. The first one then step step into the function no open and close brackets for the arrow there will be two oh, this open one and close yes step into this arrow's function again for arrow I no 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 that. it's okay yes press tab hit your tab key yes ah, those are there the... we go yeah ah i've never done it that way before that's, that's <laughs> picking up a lot today Okay, so you can have the angle, the length. The width. So those are the arguments that is going to arrow. So we can use to customize that arrow. Yeah. Because Brilliant. like me, I think this week, Tidy Tuesday, I'll try to use this, all this, what I learned today in our discussion, I'll try to implement it on my own visualization. I'll have to watch out for that one. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's good to try these things, isn't it? I might have to try some of them. There's just too much in this chapter, I think, to try it all, but arrows would be fun. Okay, so what we look at here now is it goes on to look at defaults. Yeah, so the default scales are basically that. So you can manually set scales, but scale X continuous, scale Y continuous, and color discrete are just the defaults. So I can produce it with all of those commands, or I can just run that bit. And you see it's done exactly the same thing. Those are just the defaults. But you can use scale Y continuous to set your axis breaks. So you can see this is pretty much the same plot, but we're now telling it to show Y between, go from 15 to 40 on the breaks with seven increments of seven, basically. So 15, 22, 29, 36. So we've actually reset where those come from. So that's how it was before 20, 30, 40. And now it's gone 15, 22, 29. Um, okay, you can put labels to none. So on this one, you've got no labels on the Y, but we've put in breaks on the X and we've actually labeled them manually as well. So we've gone from 0 to 8 in steps of two, and we're going again on the label 0 to 8 in steps of two. So now we've got no Y labels, 
because we put null and then we've got the naught to eight in steps of two. It's actually not shown the naught and the eight because there was, weren't data points there to plot. And you can actually put in dollar sign. So this is on the diamonds. So if we look at the basic plot, that's just showing box plots of cut and price. But using scale Y continuous, we can actually add, we've used scales label dollar. So we've put the dollar sign there on all of our scales. We can use scale Y continuous to reformat the labels. So we're actually putting it in thousands of dollars by dividing the scale by a thousand and putting K afterwards. So 15,000 becomes 15 K. Um, and then we're also changing the scale. So we're going from 1,000 to 19,000 in steps of 6,000. Oops, so if we run all of that, one from one to 19 in steps of six, and we've actually got it in sort of 13 K rather than having all the noughts on. You can do a similar thing with percent. So there we've defined the name of the axis as percentage, and we've put a percent sign. So you can do all sorts of things with it. And then guides is basically the axis and the legends together. And you, you can use breaks to highlight an exact point. So this I thought was quite nice. So we're getting the, the um, presidents of America from number, what's it, 34 upwards. Um, and we're plotting a dot at the start of their presidency and then a segment going to the end of their presidency. And then we're actually defining the breaks to be the start date and the labels to be in that format of it's a date, but we're just showing the year part of the date. And you end up with that. So that, that's quite a nice way of building a slightly different type of plot. You can see exactly when it starts and how long it lasted. Um, you can use positioning to show a theme. So we've got four different plots here, basically. This is the base plot and we haven't plotted it, we've just created it. And then we can have it with legend position left. So the legend's on the left and using theme, we can put it on the top. And each of these is basically just moving the legend around. Yeah. Using oh, no. that I don't know. Yeah. Okay, what's this one doing? Guides to format legends. So we can actually format the legend within the guides. So in this one, we've got a fairly simple plot. That's the default legend position, but we can use theme to place it at the bottom. And we can use guides. So the color of the legend is guide legend, but we're overriding the aesthetic using override AES. So you can see we've moved it to the bottom and we've made it bigger. I think that's pretty much, and it's put it all on one row as well, rather than two, because we used n row equals one. So it's just heaps. How are we doing? Crikey, it's almost five o'clock. The race. Logarithmic scales. You can either produce them by taking a log of the variable, which leaves the axis labels a bit messy, or you can use scale x log 10. And you can see we've done the same thing, but on scale X, it's actually taken log 10. And the nice thing there is you've got a clean axis. It's a good way of doing that. Okay. 
Okay, you can customize color using scale color brewer. It's a nice data set, which is good for colorblind. Um, and it's even better if you use shape as well as color, because even without color at all now, you can still tell what the data is. You can manually map the color scale. So we've got values of Republican equal to red, Democratic to blue. It's otherwise the same plot of precedence we had before. Um, but now we've got Republicans in red and Democrats in blue. Nice and clear. And if we run producer data set there, data frame, producing a thousand observations with a normal distribution. We can plot that using GeoM hex. And that's just the default X plot. We can plot it with Viridis continuous or Viridis bin. So all of these things are actually being controlled again from the scale, in this case, scale fill, because scale fill controls the color we see within GeoM hex. Then you can use various ways of adjusting what you see. Here we can zoom in using forward cut Cartesian. So if we look at it without, that's the full data set. And we can zoom in to point X, five and seven and Y, 10 to 30. So we've zoomed into that area. You could do something similar filtering the data set. But if we look what happens, we're now only fitting the line to the points in the box. So it's kind of distorting the shape of the fitted line we get. And you can also subset the data to zoom in on particular areas. So there we go, we can do both of those. Or you can train the scale on the full data set. And now we've got the scales sided. I'm not quite sure what that's doing now. Okay, so, so line 463. Okay, we have scale X uh, continuous. Okay, then we specify the limits. Then the limits we are using the range function, which is going to between the MPG dollars and displacement. So we are going to get the range of the value. And in no range, we are going to have the minimum and also the maximum value. So those value, we are storing it in a new scale called X scale. Yeah. Then if we go to line 464, uh, we are doing the same thing. We are looking for the range of all the highway, which is yeah. the minimum and maximum value. And we are storing that value in the Y scale. Then yeah. if we look at the drive, the drive is already a categorical variable. So in that case, we cannot use look for the range. Or rather, we are looking for the unique drive. We, we are looking for all the unique drive. There are three in number, which is yep. F4 and one F and four wheel drive, rear wheel drive, and front wheel drive. So we are storing all those values in the color scale. So we just pass it to our scale arguments, X scale, Y scale, and color scale. You know, by yep. default, uh, when we are building our visualization, ggplot2, even though we did not specify any scale, ggplot2 is going to scale our data for us before we get any plot. Maybe we map x, a continuous variable, we map a, another continuous variable to the y-axis. Then we now color by a certain categorical variable. 
So by default, as we are building our visualization, we already know that ggplot2 is going to use scale x continuous, is also going to use scale y continuous, is also going to use scale color discrete. So with that, it's going to derive all those information. It's going to also create uh, our legend for, so that is what ggplot2 is doing uh, at the back end. But in base R, when we are plotting with base R, it's not like that. We have to write our code manually to get all this. To generate the ledger, you need to write the code. Because if you do not supply the code, base R will not get any outputs. Yeah. So that is just a difference between ggplot2 and base R. OK. So by doing that, the effect is that we've actually, we can zoom, we can look at so yes. you've got a subset of data, but you can compare it to a different subset without the axis changing, isn't it? That's the whole yeah. point. Yes. I think me, I also have one other contribution to make between the between the code Cartesian function, between specify your limit between code Cartesian and also specify your axis limit between either scale X continuous or scale Y continuous. So we, when zooming into the plot, if we are using scale Y continuous and we specify our limits to zoom into a specific area in the plot, maybe we specify our limits. So any data areas of our data points in, that is outside that is not specified within that limit. So ggplot2 will automatically drop that data out because yeah. we did not specify that limit to drop it, it will treat it as missing data. So yeah. it, it will just return an error message. So, so, so data point has been dropped because they are out of the limit. But when we are within the code Cartesian, ggplot2 will let zoom into that area in which we specify. It will not drop any data points. So yeah. it's advisable when we are zooming into a specific area in our plot, I always advise use the code Cartesian. It's safe to use yeah. the code Cartesian. Brilliant. So that's various ways of zooming in. That's it. Here we go. Yeah. Using called Cartesian filtering, subsetting, training. That's, that's where we go. So why doesn't this override the default scale if we try plotting it? Um, Yes. Oh, this has worked because I've changed it. I think in the question it was asking, why doesn't that change it? So scale color gradient just gives you the default color. And that is yes. because um, geom hex is actually, the color is controlled through fill. So yes. you change that back to fill. You can see we've got a white to red on yep. that. This kind of confused me a bit. I mean, basically with them all, you're, you're putting a scale in. So with gradient, the first argument is always the colors and how they map to the data range. Yes, yes. Whereas with labels, the first thing is you put in the X and Y values for where the labels go. So, so you're kind of you know, defining the range first with both of those. Um, this one, the display of presidential terms by, okay, so this asks us to take the president's diagram. I didn't understand what this was asking for at all, to be honest, this bit. Combining two variants shown above. So um, maybe we can come back to that in a minute. Um, so in terms of improving the X, oh, I've run a couple of other bits, which I'm going to use later, just to annotate it. But if we take presidential, I think what I've ended up doing with the basic plot is putting, changing the title. So you've got president number. The years have gone to four year increments, which generally match the period of a presidency in America. Um, and then Asked for a bit of labeling. So I've used geom text 
um, to add various labels to explain. The thing I looked at here was you've got two, generally a president, a single term is four years, but you can yes. see there and here, we've got two presidents who didn't serve a full term. So I've labeled the diagram to explain what happened there. And I've also put the names of the presidents onto the line. Ex excellent. Kennedy was assassinated there and Nixon resigned in 74. <laughs> So I've added a bit of information onto that <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, use over. Oh, do, do you understand um, what? Uh, what was the question? I didn't. Bit of it. Combining. So change the display by combining the two variants shown above. I didn't know what variants. What variants? What variants are they referring to? Well, that, that, that was the question. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, we'll leave that. So we're running out of time. Um, so here it asks us to override AES to make a legend on this plot easier to see. So if we look at the plot, you can kind of see the legend because they've used a very low alpha, one over 20. In the legend, it's you can't see what color it is. So yes. these guides to override that and set alpha equal to one. Um, Excellent. In there, so if I run that, you can actually see the color. Of yes. The guide. Um, right. Themes. So this is kind of nice. It lets you see. So so far, everything we've looked at is in the standard are sort of gray background with white grids and stuff but you can you can change it so this is theme black and white We've got a black border white background pale gray guides you can use themes to change certain things about the title so if we run that you can see we've actually moved the legend um, box within the theme its position the way it's running, the background color of the legend block and box, and the rectangle around it. We can specify that the title is bold. You know, there's all sorts of things you can do within theme as well. So it asked us to look at theme to change a plot you last made. So that's the same plot without any theme. And I just got rid of everything. <laughs> it's not a good <laughs> lot of stuff, but it just looks different. <laughs> so you can see I've used theme void. Um, and then make the axis labels of your plot blue and bolded. So I've gone back to a more sensible theme um, with the titles and the caption. And I've actually said element text color blue and bold for the axis text. So there you go, we've got blue and bowls now. We've gone back to the plot with the information on it. Patchwork, are you okay for another five minutes on your Femi? Yes, yes, yeah? yes, yes. Just finish off. So I actually, I put a link in here because I, I saw on the first one, you put um, a link in last week, didn't you? For it was just, um, Thomas Pedersen, is yes. it? His um, yes, yeah. shop <laughs> workshop. And then in the second one, part two, which I also watched, they're, they're very good actually. That's a good link. Um, he talks. I think about, I shared I shared the video last week before our discussion last week. Oh, brilliant. there was a video. It's on the Slack. If you check the Slack, there was a video I shared. I'll have to watch that one. Okay. Yeah, because that's good. Um, so here. We're using patchwork to have two plots, plot one and plot two. And basically what it's, it's um, adding new functionality to these sort of arithmetic or logical operators to control how we can combine plot one on its own is that. Oh, no, it's, it's just storing it, isn't it, into memory and then it plots them both out, one and two. You can produce a third plot. And that pattern produces that. 
and then you combine many plots. So there you go, it's not crazy. We've got five, six, seven different plots. So ask us to look at various things. What happens if you omit the parentheses in the following plot layout? What happens? So we've got those three. I think the parentheses it spoke about in the question were like that, which puts plot one above plots. Oh, else? I didn't expect that, so I put them in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> so that's put two over three and one down the side. I think the way it was in the question, maybe, was that. But in kind, it's kind of all like the order of operations when you do maths, isn't it? Yes, yes. It changes what it does. So there, by putting brackets around P1 and 2, I've got them side by side and 3 at the bottom. So if you change the brackets or take them out, it will produce different combinations of different plots. So there it's just put, it's done the division first. It's a bit like bod mass, isn't it? Um, and then it's asked to aggregate or it asked, we're asked to recreate a patchwork, weren't we? Which if I go to the bottom, where are we? Where are we? Yeah. That's it. So it's the three plots, plot one and two above plot three. Um, that's, and it also asked us to put in fig A, fig B and fig C which was the tricky bit, um, but you can do, you can actually annotate the plots using plot annotation. There's various tag levels you can put in. You can put in a prefix and a suffix. So I've used tag level A, put fig dot space in front of it, and then semicolon behind it. And you get your fig A, fig B, fig C. Ooh, and I think, <laughs> it's been a bit of a rush through it all. <laughs> but um, I think after those exercises, it was just a quick summary telling us what we'd done. But that, I mean, there's a hell of a lot in there to go through in one hour. I mean, I was just charging. <laughs> and I think, you know, I was, I was only able to do that because you know the subject better than they do. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a very good one. Excellent uh, presentation. I think we really learned uh, a lot on how we can move from our exploratory data analysis, how to, we can really communicate our data to our audience such that they can, they can follow along with us, they can pick the key message uh, in which our visualization is passing across to them. It becomes very clear uh, for them that is the readability of the plots. Because the main aim of every visualization is that once you share it with stakeholders, they should be able to understand uh, the main process and how they need to be able to digest the visual, get key understanding, derive that insight. Uh, we, because it needs to be simple. So once somebody just pick the plots, they know what message you are trying to pass across uh, to them. I think. This chapter is a very important chapter. I really, I really learned uh, a lot. I think uh, next week uh, we'll be looking at uh, we'll be looking at strings. Uh, we will see how we can work uh, with strings. So uh, I think that is all we got for today. I want to really thank everyone for joining. Uh, others maybe they could not join. They are still busy because because of the break. But I hope by next week, we'll have more people to join. I think I'll be leading the discussion next week. I will sign up uh, in the sign-up sheet for next week's discussion. Thank you very much. No, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll see you next okay. week. See you. Yeah. Cheerio. Bye.